I want to talk to you today about how to make the most of your next six months. I don't know whether you know what the most quoted verse on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook is. In fact, it's a verse I've put on all three of those um, platforms this week because it's in the Bible in one year this week. It's from Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says this, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. But what is the context, the original context of that verse? And why is it that the context of that verse tells us so much about how we can make the most of the next six months of our lives? The original context was the exile. The people of God were in a really uncomfortable situation. They'd gone into exile in Babylon. This is the 6th century BC. It's two and a half thousand years ago. And they were, they were thinking and hoping, and in fact, the false prophets were telling them, look, don't worry, it's all going to be over really quickly. And Jeremiah comes and he says, look, actually, it's not going to be over as quickly as you would like it to be. This is a much longer period. Uh, but in the middle of this period, there is hope. And I think right now we're in a period where we desperately need hope. It's kind of like uh, we've hit a six-month wall, as one international security scholar described it. Like the first six months of the pandemic was all adrenaline and uh, we were really hoping that in this period, which is not normal, it's kind of a systematic disruption and stress, but we were hoping that by September it'll all be over, that it will have disappeared, God willing, but actually it hasn't. And there's a second spike, there's a second wave, and it, it's a period where we, we hit what this, this scholar described as this wall where we experience um, fear and exhaustion and anxiety and boredom and isolation and it's tough, it's difficult. I know for some of you it's, it's really tough right now but for all of us I think it, there's, there's just there's a huge amount of, of stress around and it can come out in, in all kinds of ways. I, I um, went to get some money out of the bank a few days ago and uh, I, by mistake, I put in my credit card instead of my debit card and it refused to give me the money, so I put in the debit card and I got it. But then I got a message from the bank saying that there'd been some unusual activity on my account and I needed to contact the fraud department. So I contacted them and I said, I think I just put in my credit card by mistake uh, and tried to get some money out and then I put in my debit card. They said, well, we can't talk to you until you've answered some security questions. So they asked me a whole load of security questions and I think I got most of them right. I got my name right, I got my date of birth, I got my mother's maiden name, but then they started asking me all sorts of questions. I just didn't have the information at hand, so I couldn't tell them. And so they said, well, I'm sorry, we're going to have to close all your accounts. So I said, well, it's me. Uh, I tried to be nice, but I was like, ah, just don't, please don't close my accounts, it's me. Anyway, they said, no, we're going to close your account. So they did. And uh, then we rang through and I, and I, and I said, look, now I've, now I've got all the details. And they said, no, it's too late. We've closed your accounts. Now you need to send a picture of your passport. So I took a picture of my passport and I sent that. And I thought, right, that's it. No, they said, that's not good enough because you need to send a picture of your passport, you holding your passport. So I took a photo of me holding my passport and I sent it in. I thought, now nah, they're going to open my accounts. But no, then there was an, a phone call. They phoned when I was with a bishop, so I couldn't answer. So I just said, sorry, and, uh, will you ring later? Well, they didn't ring, so I had, had to, to ring them. And I rang and I got into this answer machine which said, your call is being held in a queue. You are advancing in the queue. So I great, I'm nearly there. And that was like, Five minutes, ten minutes, eventually it was like 20, I looked at it on my phone, it was 25 minutes when they eventually answered. By that stage I was ready to kill whoever it was who answered. 
but the guy said, now I need to ask you some security questions, sir. Oh, okay, I answered, I answered all the security questions, and I kept thinking, I, I, I feel so cross, but I, I've got to be nice, because I, I, I was reminded of the fact it says on my card, the Reverend Nicholas Gumbel. And I thought, I mustn't, I mustn't. But I wanted, I, I felt the frustration. I think we're all feeling this kind of frustration. I'm not naturally a patient person, and so uh, I get very, very easily irritated by that, these kind of situations. But I think it's part of the situation we're in right now, where there is so much frustration. And uh, the context of Jeremiah is, it's not just that they were going through such a difficult time, they were cut off from the source that fed them. The, the people of God, the worst thing about the exile for the people of God was being away from the temple, because the temple was the place of the presence of God. That's where they went to get their souls refreshed. And I think it's the same for us right now. We are, we're kind of cut off from so often the sources that feed us, whether it's like being, in, being able to sing in church, coming together for, for worship is so refreshing. Being with family and friends, uh, you know, that's been one of the most frustrating things for us personally is not being able to see family and friends because they are a source of nourishment. They feed our souls and hugs and all these kind of things that, that are just kind of feed us, we're cut off from. And this is the context in the book of Jeremiah. And this is where this amazing promise comes from, from, from the Lord. I, I have plans for you to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And in the New Testament, it's even stronger. So this, this promise applies to you because all the promises of God are yes in Christ. And God, we're told in the New Testament, has a purpose for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. And in this context, in Jeremiah, we're told how we can make the most of this time of waiting, this time of frustration. And what the prophet Jeremiah essentially says in this letter to the exiles is bloom where you're planted. He says this, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in numbers and do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity. That's actually one word in the original Hebrew. It's, it's shalom. It's like... It, it, it's untranslatable by one English word because it's such a beautiful word. It means seek the good, the peace, the blessing, all kinds of goodness and love in the community that you're in. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. In other words, he says, bloom where you are planted. Make the most of the situation that you find yourself in. Don't be wishing that it was all over and that you were somewhere else. As St. Paul writes to the uh, Corinthian church, he, he writes this. Don't be wishing you were someplace else or with someone else. Where you are right now is God's place for you. It may not be where you want to be, but it's where you are. Life is short. Don't wait for this time to be over. As Eugene Peterson, uh, who, who uh, translated the message translation, uh, puts it in his commentary on Jeremiah. The only place you have to be human is where you are right now. The only opportunity you'll ever have to live by faith is the circumstance you're provided with this very day. This house that you live in, this family you find yourself in, this job you've been given, the weather conditions that prevail at the moment. In other words, make the most of every day, make the most of every moment. And bloom in your relationship with God. The context of, of Jeremiah 29, 11 is the verses that follow where the Lord says through Jeremiah, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you declares the Lord. This is, is so beautiful. We can, we can seek God in this time. 
I think like a few days ago, I reached this point where I thought I have got so many anxieties and worries. There's so many things that are going wrong or potentially going wrong with my health, with family health, with decisions that I had to take with, with people, with pastoral situations. There are just so many things going wrong. I thought, rather than just worrying about all these things, I'm going to give up. I'm going to resign as the general manager of the universe and I'm just going to hand all of this stuff over to God. I'm just going to say, Lord, you take the lot. All I'm going to do is seek you in this time. And so that's what I do. I, I, start, I, have, a, I have a routine that at the moment, which is like I do the Bible in one year in the morning. That's so important. I want to seek God. First thing, Lord, what are you saying to me today? And then right now, then my routine is, because uh, I can't go to the gym right now, is I run around the park in, in the morning and try, trying to pray as I run. And then I meet up with, with my wife, Pips, in the park, and we walk around the park trying very unsuccessfully to pray together. But it's a way that we're trying to seek God at this time, to hear what he's saying. And I want to encourage you, if you have never found that relationship with God, this is the promise, if you seek God, you will be, he will be found by you. He says, seek me and if you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. And uh, if, you, if you've never done Alpha before, I would really encourage you, this is a great time. You can do it online. You know, Pippa and I are on our 91st Alpha Small Group, our second one online. And it's so amazing to see people there seeking God. And what I love about Alpha, it's a place where we can encounter Jesus and experience the fact that Jesus, in Jesus you find love. Jesus loves you so much he died for you. And not only that, he was raised to life. That means that this life is not the end. There is hope beyond the grave. This is wonderful. We have such amazing good news. And you can experience on the Alpha Saturday now that we, instead of the weekend on the Holy Spirit, we have a Saturday on the Holy Spirit. And people there on the last course yet again experience God's love being poured into their hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been described as the energy of God. I love the way in which the African-American theologian, Howard, Dr. Howard Thurman, describes this. You know, uh, this is Black History Month, and, and I commend to you this book again by um, Howard Thurman, Jesus and the Disinherited. This is the book he wrote in 1949. Howard Thurman, grandmother, had been a slave. He was taught the faith by his grandmother. And this is a beautiful book which influenced Martin Luther King in the civil rights movement. In fact, Martin Luther King carried this book in his pocket on the Montgomery marches. And Howard Thurman describes the experience of the Holy Spirit. He said, he says, it, it's, it's like the, the moment of when time is intersected by eternity. This is the experience of the supernatural God who loves you. Jesus who died for you, the Holy Spirit who fills your heart. It's like a kind of taste of eternity. And what Jeremiah says is bloom, take this opportunity to bloom in your relationship with God and in the, in the, in the community around you. Have an impact. Seek the peace and prosperity of the place where you are. You can have an influence just by, by your life, wherever you are, however small you may feel, however small you may feel your, your, your sphere of influence is, you can have an influence. I heard about a woman who was, uh, worked in, in a supermarket, and isn't it amazing right now, the people that we have so much respect for are the people who work in shops, the bus drivers, the people in the NHS, uh, the people who, maybe before the pandemic, the, we didn't have the same respect that we have for them now, but the world has been turned upside down. And uh, every time I go into a, a shop, I, I, I thank the person. I say, thank you so much for doing this job. It's so important. And this, this woman, she worked in a, in a supermarket. She worked on the checkout till. Or what she did was check out, check out the, the customers and fill their baggage their, their bags with the, with the shopping. 
But what she did was she used her sphere of influence. It was only six foot square influence. But what she did was she was always greeted them enthusiastically. She learnt their names and she remembered their names. She asked after their families. And when they'd finished, she always said, I'll pray for you and your family. And this caused a problem because everybody wanted to be checked out by her. So there would be like four checkout tills, three would be empty, and then there'd be this long line of people waiting to be checked out by this wonderful woman who was using her sphere of influence. When she died, the church was absolutely ram-packed with her customers who had come to eulogize about the impact of this woman on their life. And you too can have that impact on those around you by little acts of kindness, by, by your words. Your words are so powerful. By your words, you can change someone's day. And even in the most difficult circumstances, you can make a difference. I love this book. Uh, the, it's called The Choice, written by this Edith Eager. When she was 16 years old, she's, she was a ballerina. She's now a psychologist. She was age 16, in 1944, she was sent to Auschwitz, and her book is called The Choice. Even in hell, hope can fly. Whatever situation you are in, hope can fly because of Jesus. Because Jesus died for you and for me, and he was raised to life. And that means that there is hope beyond this life. Uh, you know, I was, I was an atheist. I didn't believe in, in Jesus, but I encountered Jesus and I found that in Jesus there is life and life in all its fullness. Doesn't mean that life is easy. Sometimes life is hard and sometimes hopes seem to be dashed. I remember when I finished at theological college. I'd been a barrister. I loved my work as a barrister. I went to theological college and after three years I started to look for a place to go and work, to be, to be a, like a trainee vicar. And I went round all these parishes. And I went, we went to nine parishes and none of them worked out. We were turned down over and over again. You may, not, you may think that's not very surprising, but it was very disappointing. And we ended up without hope of ever finding a job. And I was thinking, maybe I need to go back, try and go back to being a barrister. And then I got a phone call from Sandy Miller, who was the vicar of HDV at the time, saying he was in a position to offer me a job here 34 years ago. I'm so thankful that all those places turned me down. I'm so thankful that out of the midst of those disappointments, hope arose. And that's what the prophet is saying. I love the way that, that uh, Eugene Peterson translates Jeremiah 29, verse 11. He says, I, God says this, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. And in the New Testament, it's even more amazing, a good, pleasing and perfect plan for your life, and even more solid hope. So don't waste the next six months. Make the most of every day and every moment of every day, because God has a good purpose for you. He wants to give you hope and a future. Bloom where you are planted. Don't be wishing you were someplace else or with somewhere else. Where you are right now is where God wants you to be. And you have a purpose, you have a hope, and not only that, you are on the front line of bringing hope to everyone around you. In Jesus' name. What we're going to do right now is we're going to do what we always do. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come to you right where you are, in your home, and into your heart. And I ask Pips, my wife Pippa, to come and join us as we pray for the Holy Spirit to come.
Let's invite the Spirit of God right now to come to you where you are so that you know that God has a good purpose for you to give you hope and a future. The future you hope for. Lord, that's our prayer right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Now back in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was in the temple. That's why the people were so sad in exile. Right now, the Holy Spirit has come in the person of Jesus. And now, Jesus says, he comes into your home. We will come and make our home with you. And the Holy Spirit is coming right now to your home and into your heart so that you know that you are loved by God, that you have a hope, not just for this life, but for all eternity. And I think some of you, it's like, when I was talking about all my worries, you think, oh, you've got far more worries. You have far more worries, then you need to hand those over. So I want to encourage you to right now do that, to take all that stuff, to seek the Lord, but to hand to him the stuff, that the frustrations, the, maybe the anger, the sadness, the fears, frustrations and just say, Lord, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to seek you with all of my heart. And if you just feel exhausted and don't want to go on, not going on like this today, the Lord can refresh you and mm -hmm. give you fresh vision for that future and hope. The, even if you feel that you've come to a full stop, there's a new start. And the Lord is pouring out his spirit upon everybody to say, come on, you can keep going. And he can renew you, restore you, give you that energy and strength for this next phase of the journey of the race. There's a race set before you. There's a goal out there for each one of you to run to. Take the strength, the power of God again. When breathe deeply the, the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen you for this next part of the journey. Uh, and I sense what the Holy Spirit wants to give you is shalom. That peace, that, that word which means far more than peace, well-being, spiritual prosperity, goodness, love, all the positive things that the Holy Spirit wants to bring to your life is summed up in that word, shalom, peace. And some of you right now, you're, you're sensing just a deep, deep peace in your heart. And that's evidence that the Holy Spirit is filling you right now, giving you hope and enabling you to be a bearer of hope. In Jesus' name.